You welcome the Second Baptist Church. For God's love comes first. It is a great day outside. It may be a typical Oklahoma day where we kind of go from a, an early spring to, to summer. It is warm, but it's nice in here, and we appreciate you coming. Uh, I already said what I needed to say. Brother Dennis is here. Thank you, Brother Dennis, for coming. Hope that God's work. Is there anything else that I need to announce today that uh, is coming up in the next few days? Okay. Yes, sir? <laughs> we are doing a birthday offerings, so we'll just jump right into that. And since Linda's already been called out, I'm going to expect she'll be the first one in line. So thank you for that, Linda. So if you have a birthday in the month of May or an anniversary or a spiritual birthday that we want to celebrate in the month of May, I would invite you to come forward. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. yesterday and the contacts that were made and, and father for the the beacon that you called us to be for us to be able to come out and, and just uh, visit with our community and ha have conversations and have times of prayer and have the just the devotional father we just thank you so much because uh, father we, we we know that you were there we know that you were talking you know the spirit was moving and father i just uh, thank you for that day and, and father i just uh, pray that uh, for those contacts to be made we'll have a chance to have a conversation Father, and just share with them that you loved us so much. You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. Father, we just ask you to be with our worship time today, Father. I pray that everything will be blocked out of our minds. That we won't be concerned about the things coming up in the, in the upcoming days and weeks. Father, for the next hour or so, that our hearts and minds will be solely focused on you. Father, we thank you for Brother Dennis. Just lift him up to you. Pray that you'll hide him behind the cross on this day. That the words you would put on his heart be the words we need to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Welcome this morning. Stand to your feet as we begin. I worship you.
your name. We thank you, Lord, for your many, many blessings and your answered prayers. And Lord, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters in Christ that are present here today. We thank you for Brother Dennis. And Lord, we thank you for dying on the cross for us. And I pray that you bless this money with your needs. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
chapter, at the end of that chapter, the last five verses that are there, five or six verses, 42 through 47. And I'll invite your attention to those in a moment as we share in reading the scripture together. Appreciate so much the opportunity to be here and to be able to preach with you. Um, when he calls me, he says, now if you're too busy or you need a week off, I'm never too busy to preach. You know, I may have retired from some things, but you don't retire from opening the book and preaching. That's what God called you to do. And 
You know, I, I can't think of a better way to go than standing in the pulpit. And so maybe a little shock to you if I went that way. <laughs> and then, of course, there would be some that say, finally he shut up. You know, so there are different ways to look at that. The book of Acts is a powerful, powerful book of history. And keep in mind, it is a book of history. It is not intended to be a book of doctrinal teaching. It is the revelation of doctrine. History is the living out of what we believe. And so in the book of Acts, you find the unfolding of a life of faith and of God's faithful people and of God's work through the Holy Spirit in the lives of those people. And so it's a very powerful book as it gives to us the days and the walking of that early church. And it allows us to see the unfolding of that. You may remember that Jesus was crucified at Passover. And some 40 days later, 50 days later, at Pentecost, you have the coming of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of God's people with the Spirit. And you see that taking place there in the first part of this chapter that we're going to read the latter part together. And so you find that as they preparing, that Jesus has told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. So they're gathered together in their upper room praying, and the Spirit comes upon the people. And as the Spirit comes, those people spread out across Jerusalem in one of those most phenomenal things that have ever happened in the history of the world. They go preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what happens is there are people from everywhere gathered in Jerusalem for this festival time and for this celebration of the harvest. And you find that as they hear these men preaching, everyone hears them speaking in his own language. And they look and say, they're Galileans. But we hear them speaking in our own language. And the Holy Spirit had empowered the sharing of the gospel on that occasion. And they begin to look at these guys and say, and these people and say, listen, it's not but 10 o'clock in the morning, but they're drunk. And how do you like that for an introduction to your sermon? <laughs> and Peter, after they make that accusation, Peter stands up and preaches. And if you can read through the sermon, he basically just says, this is the story of Jesus. The one who was prophesied, the one who came, the one you killed. And now he is resurrected. And the prophets, prophet has been fulfilled that Joel spoke of. In the last days, my spirit shall come upon my people. And when Peter finished preaching, over 3,000 people, turned their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. What a phenomenal time. This celebration of the harvest. And God uses that just like He used Passover, the fulfillment of Christ becoming the Passover Lamb, dying on the cross. He uses Pentecost and the blessing of the harvest to thrust His church into the limelight of that ancient world. So I want you to understand that this passage that we're going to share together, which gives us a picture of the life of that church filled with the Holy Spirit. What it looked like, how they behaved, what was happening in their midst. And so I want you to understand that this is a critical thing because this is the church that is unfolding its ministry and its witness through the rest of the book of Acts. So you need to get this paragraph. 
and understand that this is the church that God is blessing. Now, I want to say something else as we move into this. I want to say something else about the church. You know, we, we hear so much, or I do, and I trust you probably do too, and sometimes we're guilty of saying things. And we look into our world, and all of us know we live in a decadent world. It's not hard to figure out. It has been severely brought on to us just these past days in our own county, and then just a little bit south in Dallas, things in California. I mean, it is a wicked, depraved, decadent world, isn't it? And we look and say, well, you know, what's happening to the church? Look what's happening in the world. Why don't you understand something? Those are not relied, related to one another. What's happening in the church is not dependent upon what's happening in the world. And I, I, I think sometimes we get the idea, well, if the world was straightened on prior life, then the church would be better off. No. Because the church is not dependent on the world. Now, the world depends on the church. Amen. But the church doesn't depend on the world. Amen. You see, as bad as our world is, we're still not as bad as what the pages of the New Testament were. If you want to read about decadence, you want to read about depravity, go back into the history books and examine the life of those ancient prophets and of their vassal states around them and all that was taking place. And you realize that God chose one of the worst times in human history to birth His church. But you know what? That's how our God works. Amen. Because that's His power. And He says, here is the power of the gospel. I can plant the gospel and a gospel-centered church, centered church in Jerusalem and commission it to reach the world. And in just a few short years, the gospel was known all over that ancient world. And churches had been planted and not too long into the future when the Roman Empire is about to fall apart the witness and the gospel presence of that church in that world was so strong that the Romans said, well, if we'll make that the official church of the Roman Empire, it might draw us together. And so they made that church the official church of the Roman Empire. They wanted all of their soldiers to be baptized so they'd have them march along the edge of cliffs. They'd have people up on the cliffs with branches of water, sprinkling water on the armies trying to baptize them to make Christians out of them. Of course, you know how that works, just like I do. But what I want you to understand is the phenomenon of what we see happening in this passage. Here is a group of people who have given themselves to God and to His Spirit and have been anointed by him to go into the world and share the gospel. Now they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so what we really are going to, going to read together is a word picture of that New Testament church. And as we read through it, I think you'll be able to envision in your mind, and I, I fully understand that most of you have read this passage before, but as we read through it, you're going to envision in your mind that early church and those apostles and those people that are gathered with them. We don't even know who they all were. And what was happening in their midst? So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me and look with me in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading with verse 40. To follow with me as I read. If you don't have your Bible with you, I think you'll find it on the screen as well. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a powerful picture of Christ's church. Let's take a moment and look through it. Now let me just call your attention to some things that out of this passage that are parts of this picture that are extremely important for us to get a hold of. You find it begins by saying, and they devoted themselves. That, that term is used twice in this passage. It's used here and again in verse 46. And so what it, what it simply says is that the church continued to commit itself, to hold fast to, to persevere in these things. And they devoted themselves, they persevered, they committed themselves to the apostles' teaching. You see, the apostles had been given a word by God to give instruction to that early church. And as that early church began to grow, it maintained the devotedness to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching was gospel-centered life. A life driven but the gospel message of Jesus Christ. <coughs> you know, if you take the Bible, you find the gospel flowing from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. It is the heart of what is believed. And they continued believing and devoting themselves to this apostle's message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can just read through Peter's sermon that I alluded to just a moment ago. And you can get the idea that as he was preaching and teaching on this, just prior to this passage and the unfolding of this passage, the gospel's at the center of his preaching. The good news of Jesus Christ. Now this has to be said in contrast with the teaching that was going on before. For the teaching that was going on before centered on the law. And the apostles' teaching unfolds a new dynamic that God has come and through Christ He fulfills His law in us. And we who were unrighteous have become righteous because of what Christ has done. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You find the second thing in that first verse. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Notice that has an article in front of it. It doesn't say that they devoted themselves to fellowship. It says to the fellowship. Giving emphasis to it. You see, this fellowship is a little different than what we think about when we think about fellowship. When we think about the fellowship and we talk about wanting good fellowship in the body, we're talking about sweet feelings one for another, you know, standing around, singing songs around the campfire, kumbaya, whatever, you know, and, and of course, food. Food is always a part of, of fellowship, you know. And we kind of get into that mode. But I want to tell you, that's just one little sliver of New Testament fellowship. The word fellowship literally means partnership, participation, a sharing in, a close relationship. And so this word koinonia, it, it takes in a, a much bigger picture than what we see most of the time. And, and so it says here you, they have this major shift in their lives into this fellowship 
of this body of believers. And what that means is they have come to be a part of this church and they're actively participating in this church. They have developed a communion and a sharing and a, and a oneness with one another. But it's on much more than just an emotional, casual level. It, it is a deep commitment to participate and activity in the body of Christ. Let me just share something with you real quick. You will gain a closer fellowship with your Christian brothers and sisters working beside them in ministry than you ever will eating beside them in your kitchen. Amen. Now, I'm not against eating beside folks in the kitchen, okay? I've done a plenty of that in my life because it's a Baptist way that I get that. But that is not fellowship by itself. Fellowship is God's people sharing their lives in service to Him, participating in the life of the body. You see, this early church came together with the conviction that everybody was a part and everybody had a part. There were no bench warmers. If you're a sports person, you know what that means. Everybody plays in the game. That's what it means to have fellowship. And these folks were devoted to that. They understood the importance of that. They were committed to the apostles' te teaching, the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Now this one's a little harder to wrap our minds around. There are those who would greet this and say that we're committed to the Lord's Supper. There are others who would read this and say what they're talking about here is the communal meals that they often share together, mostly in their homes. I'm not sure we can ever know for sure which one they're talking about here. I tend to believe it was both. Because in that New Testament world, you find that their sharing of the Lord's Supper happened at the same time they were sharing food together. It happened around the table, just like it did with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus and his disciples had met for a meal in the upper room and they had shared together in the food and the fellowship that went with that and then he turned his attention, took the cup, took the bread and instituted the Lord's <coughs> Supper, the Last Supper, with his disciples. And that's the way it took place in the New Testament from what we can read and put together. So when he says they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're talking about not just the Lord's Supper, but they're talking about this fellowship meal that they often had together. And part of the purpose of that meal was for people to eat because not everybody has the food. So there would be at least one time in the sharing of that, whenever, in fact, if you if you turn over to Corinthians, when Paul rebukes the Corinthians for messing up the Lord's Supper like they did a lot of other things, you find that this meal had become a place of gluttony. And in fact, they didn't even wait on the working hungry people to get there. By the time they got there, the food, the people that really needed the food, they'd run out. And Paul says, what are you doing? You've missed the purpose. So he said, here they are. They're devoted to the breaking of bread. Lots of things happen. Good things when we break bread together. And this early church understood that both the sharing of a meal and the remembering 
of our Lord who gave himself for us. But look at the fourth thing they devoted themselves to in this first verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. We miss that. Now the prayers here is probably a formal term because if you know anything about the temple and the synagogue, they had formal times of prayer each day where you went to the synagogue or you went to the temple to pray. If you couldn't get there, you turned toward it and you paused and you had that time of prayer. They continued to honor the times of prayer. But I want to tell you something else. We know also from in the book of Acts and reading later that this prayers was not just centered at the place of worship. It was centered in their home. That when they gathered in their homes, and they gathered in their homes all the time, that prayer was a part of what took place when they gathered in their homes. Now here's what you need to understand about that early church. And this is borne out as you read through the book of Acts. This was a deeply devoted praying fellowship. I'm going to tell you something right now. The power of your church will equate to the prayer life of your body. Those two things come together. If you don't have power, you're neglecting prayer. Those two things go hand in hand. And so you find that they devoted themselves to prayer. It was a part of their lives. They prayed in the temple. They prayed in Fitzroy. They prayed in their homes. This prayer was tied to the life of the community together. <clears throat> you find that those that are gathered in the upper room, it says they had gathered there and they were praying. They were obeying God and praying for that moment when he would send his spirit. They were praying. There are a lot of things that you and I cannot accomplish for a variety of reasons. One is we're weak. Another is we're sometimes stubborn. Sometimes we don't know how. But you know what? There is not anything our God cannot accomplish. Amen. He is all powerful. He is all wise. Yes. He is all knowing. Yes. There is not anything that he is not able to do. Yes. And do you understand prayer takes me, a weak, sinful, limited person, and connects it to a pure, holy, powerful, mighty God. And suddenly my life is not dependent on the resources of Dennis. My life is dependent on the resources of my Father who is in heaven. Amen. And that's what this early church had discovered. That God had the power and God had the answers for their lives. One of my favorite verses in all of the scriptures is Acts 4.31. Acts 4.31 says simply, And when they had prayed together, the place was shaken. Now the early church was going through persecution. The disciples had been arrested. They're on trial for their lives. They're thinking that they may be killed. And the early church got together and prayed. And you need to read your prayer. It is a phenomenal way of praying. It wasn't one of those whining prayers like I pray. God, life is so hard for me today. I'm just so much going on. God, I need you here. Their prayer was, God, you are sovereign. You are Lord. You are master. 
You are King of kings and Lord of lords and all powerful. And Lord, now the hands of men have threatened us. But God, we don't care because we're going to preach your word. So anoint your people for your witness. And you know what? God answers that kind of prayer. And he filled that place. And it said, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. It means that God's power come upon them in such a mighty way that the building started rattling. It was shook. Sure. And it wasn't an earthquake because it didn't fall apart. It just shook. I think it's a very valid question for each one of us to ask ourselves as we look at this early church and their commitment to pray. How and when and where have I prayed in such a way before God that my life has been shaken? Because here's the truth. We need shaking sometimes. We do. You know, wake up. Now look what happens next. And awe came upon every soul. When God works, His people know it's Him. The word there translated awe is the word phobia. It means fear. We know what phobias are. If I throw a snake down out there, some of you have a phobia. You're going to make room for it. Plenty of room. You know, it needs to be fear. Here, it's a good kind of fear. Everybody thinks fear is bad. Fear is healthy. Now, there's unhealthy fears. I get that. I, I realize that. But fear is healthy. It's something God put in us to protect us. And I'm going to tell you, a healthy fear of God is very protecting for us. I love my dad dearly. But I think I still fear him to this day. <laughs> Why, it's healthy. It's not a bad thing. I remember one time, my wife was talking to him about her boys, and they'd had some girlfriends over, and they'd talk a little bit, and they all left, and she said, you know they're all scared to death of you? <laughs> I looked back at her and I said, is that supposed to be a bad thing? <laughs> there is a holy reverence, fear before the Lord our God that is healthy and good. And they do that. Awe fell on that place. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. What is God doing in our midst that turns our eyes to the heaven and say, God, you are awesome in this place. See how you're working. Signs and wonders. What is God doing in our midst? There's a barrenness of our souls and our spirits and I think it's connected to our lack of prayerfulness and our lack of understanding about how to pray in a New Testament kind of way. They were filled with fear at the signs and wonders that were being done through the apostles. Verse 44 continues this picture. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This is not forced sharing. This is not socialism. This is transformed giving. This is people who have the generosity of God in their hearts and they see their brothers hurting and in need and they share what they've got with their brothers. To the point that some of them are selling their lands and bringing the money in and distributing among those who have need. 
This was the movement of the gospel on the hearts and lives of God's people in giving and sharing one with another. You know, that's what love does. This tells us how intense the love was in that early body. You know, your love in your church needs to be as strong as your love in your intermediate family. There's no need to think I wouldn't do for my wife. If I want to know that, I'll tell her. She's not here today. She's with grandkids. But I'm going to tell you, in 45, 46, whatever it is, she's already figured it out. And if I don't want to do it, she's figured out how to get me to do that. <laughs> That's what love does. This was love-driven sharing. They had all things together. And they shared. In verse 46, it continues this picture. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Day by day. You know what? Let me translate that for you. They went to church every day. They went to church every day. Have you read anything lately about church attendance among God's people? Most people in today's world, if they attend twice a month, they count themselves as faithful attendants. Try that at your workplace and see how it flies. <laughs> Try that at your home and see how it flies. What happened to being faithful? And day by day, they met together. Now let me tell you, I can't validate this from Scripture. But I don't think I'm far off. Let me tell you why they didn't miss. Why they met day by day. They won't miss anything. They won't miss it. I mean, they're having people say it every day. They don't want to miss it. their food with glad and generous hearts. We've all been there. You bring the food out, you set it on the table and somebody snarls and wrinkles their nose and says, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't know about your house. That didn't work in my house. The house I grew up in or the house with my boys. If my mama or my wife put it on the table, you ate it. You said, well, I don't like it. That's really immaterial. I don't care. In fact, if you voiced that, you probably got a little bit more of it. <laughs> so you learn pretty quick that if you didn't like something, you kind of was quiet. They were enjoying the moment. It was with gladness and generous hearts. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. They got along with one another. They were gracious. The word favor is a root word of grace. They were enjoying the moment. They were having fun together. I remember a story I read a few years ago. And this little girl who wanted to church where their grandma and her grandma attended one of those churches where everybody was very sober and long-faced and, you know, 
you, you get the impression. And she's walking along the road and she sees this old mule standing beside the road. The old mule standing there with its head down, its ears flopped over and its nose all down. And she looked at that old mule and said, you must go to the same church my grandchildren." <laughs> God's people are a happy people. Amen. They are a joyous people. They are a generous people. They are a glad people because they understand the grace of God. Let me tell you something. They're not going to be any laughter in hell. They're going to be a lot in heaven. They're not going to be any laughter. They're not going to be any joy in hell. I heard a church glad, happy place. They enjoyed being there. They didn't want to miss. They didn't get up saying, do we have to go to church today? And it was every day, by the way. They got up. We get to do this. You see, this is a picture of this church that's going to explode into the rest of the book of Acts. This picture of joy and praise and worship and adoration. This healthy body that everyone is a part of. And here's the last line. And the Lord added to their number day by day day those who are being saved. Day by day in one of the most pagan, decrepit, awful <coughs> societies you could find. And people were coming to Jesus. Day by day You know, if the average church across this region baptizes 15 to 20 people a year, we feel like, hey, this has been a good year. This has been a good year. By new standards. Day by day. Day by day, people would be saying, well, let's just say it's just one. That's 365. Amen. How long has it been since you baptized 365 people? And I'm right there with you. I, I, I get what we're at. You see, when the church gets right and it becomes this kind of body, filled with the Spirit of God, then God can take that church out into the world and He can do what He needs to do with it. Amen. That's where we're at, people. The problem's not the world. It's in here. Amen. In here. It's in here. Let me give you some quick application points. Quickly. I want you to understand, number one, there is no substitute for devotion to the local church. We need the church, and the church needs us, and it is essential to our spiritual health, and it is essential to what God wants to do in our world. We cannot have a blasé commitment to the local church. It is the deepest commitment we have in our life. There's no substitute for it. Second thing, correct teaching is important in the body of Christ. A gospel-centered, Bible-centered teaching that says God has given it to us. We are to teaching them to observe all things that I have 
commanded you. Correct teaching is important because if you don't have correct teaching, you won't have correct living. We learn how to live a holy life as we study about a holy God. And we come to understand Him. So it's important. Third thing, fellowship is critical for the life of the body. The right kind of fellowship. A participation, a joining together in the service. Fourth thing, much prayer is required for a healthy, growing body. Prayer is a normal and natural part of healthy body life. And I use the term much prayer that comes from what Jesus told his disciples when the man brought his son and they couldn't heal him. And they asked Jesus, why could we not do this? And he said, this kind only goes out through much prayer. And what I want us to understand, there are things God wants to do in your life and in your church and in our families together that will only happen when we pray. Much prayer is necessary for a growing church. Fifth thing, the movement of God, the work of God, validates and encourages the gospel proclamation. What is God doing in our midst that we see and give glory and say, only God? <coughs> see, I, I've already shared that I think this is directly proportional and tied to prayer. We need to remember what James says. We have not because we ask not. And we need to remember what Paul teaches us in Ephesians 3.20. Our prayers are based on the bigness and the abundance of God, not limited to our own asking or thinking. God wants to do far more than we can even imagine. And I know some people with pretty vivid imaginations. Amen. And God is capable of beyond that. You see, we want to see God work in such a way that leaves us looking and say, I never dreamed. I never dreamed. The movement of the hand of God. Sixth thing. Every believer needs to be a part of a large group and a part of a small group. They were attending the temple this was before they were driven from the temple. They attended the temple, and then they were in their homes. Scattered across Jerusalem. Many houses were marked off for the fellowship and the meeting of that early church. Many of the believers had people into their homes. And they join together for praise and worship and prayer in the temple as well. We need both. In the worship, we find motivation. We find being a part of a large group in worship and praise encourages us. In the small group, we're able to hone into the scripture individually. We're able to care for one another in a different way. Both are extremely important. Last thing, every believer must contribute to the body as well as receive from the body as God gives the increase. You are important for what you give. And I'll tell you something else, you will receive back in proportion to what you give. That's just the way it works. over the years as a pastor I've had people say well I'm just not getting a whole lot out coming to church right now and it didn't take me very long to learn to look back at and say well, what are you putting into it 
I understand the church has responsibility to minister and give the word and teach and do those things, but I also understand that you have a responsibility to be a participating part, investing in the kingdom through Christ's church. What are you putting in? years ago, my wife and I stood in the First Baptist Church of Pearl, Mississippi and pledged our lives to one another. To love and hold and serve and be together as long as God gives us bread. But you know what? It didn't take us long to figure out that we were going to get out of that relationship what we put into it. And, yeah. and like anyone in that relationship, there's ebb and flow to that. But we learned that pretty quick. And we learned that the advice that somebody told us when they said, well, you know, it's a 50-50 deal. No, it's not. You can't put 50% in and her fit put 50% in and have a decent relationship. It took 100% of me and 100% of her. how God takes it and unfolds it 